Hello, good evening, and welcome to EEZY, Easy FM 107.5, broadcasting to you from the nation's capital, Accra. My name is Mike Egan, and tonight I invite you to join me in a conversation with a gentleman who is an authority in linguistics. He was born on the 21st of March 1954 in a small village in the Bakwai municipality called Kukufu, Kukufu Ejunasi in the Ashanti region. He first stepped in a classroom at the age of six. Prevailing circumstances were such that he had to work to earn money to, to further his primary education. He became a people teacher and a choir master and was nicknamed Teacher Kitwa because of his small stature. He entered university at the age of 35. Today he is 64 years and highly educated and he has risen to the apex of his chosen career. He is recognized and respected as a major authority in linguistics. He has published 39 articles, authored 11 books, addressed audiences here in Ghana and abroad, and still writing. My pleasure and honor to engage in a conversation with the acting dean of the School of Performing Arts, University of Ghana, Legon, mm -hmm. Professor Opain Kofi Ejekum. Professor, good to see you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the honor of allowing us to come into your office. It's my pleasure. I'd like us to begin from a very strange point of view. You were described first as teacher Ketua. Yes. Now you are a professor and a mighty authority in your chosen career. Yes. Opinion. How do you marry the two? Well, first and foremost, I would have to say that it's all by the grace of the Almighty God who has carved a kind of niche for me. Because I started from a very humble background. My father died when I was 14 years in the elementary school. And uh, I was left with nothing from his side. Nothing was given to me. But my mother was uh, a peasant farmer. So she managed a little. So after elementary school, as you rightly said, I had to do some people teaching. And I was sent to a small village in Mponwa district called Akonfuri. It's very close to Nyinehini. I talked there for three years, trying to gather some money to be able to enter into training college. So after those years, I went to Nkransan Training College. That was from 1972 to 1976. Whilst there, I just planned my life that that was not going to be the end. Unfortunately, we had a history tutor called Mr. C.K. Buabin. And he jokingly said, if you are a four year, then you are a senior people teacher. Because if you look at the ladder, those who are seconds, those who are graduates, so graduates, seconds, then a four year, then people teacher. So that gave us the motivation to try to move forward. So I registered for O level for NovDEC on my own. I never attended any classes. So when I came home from school in July, I had to sit for the exams in November. I was posted to a village close to Kumasi. It's about six kilometers away from Kumasi. It's now almost part of Kumasi called Sewia. And because of the proximity to Kumasi, I could sit there, come to Kumasi, write the exams, get back, do my teaching. And that was where I did my O level. And I still felt I could move forward. So I registered for A level. So at the time that I was preparing for the A level, I had done the first year. I didn't get all the, all the three subjects. General people I had, I had two other subjects. Then I met a man from a native of that town, so we are called Mr. J.Y. Foucault, who was then a student at the School of Ghanaian Languages at the Jumakon. And I was doing Akan as one of my subjects. So from school, I'll go to him for some tutorials. And then he gave me 
the option that it looks as if I can do well if I take a diploma. So he bought the forms for me. I sat for the exams and gained admission. But I planned my life in such a way that at any point that I'll qualify for steady leave, I should move. So I taught at Sewia LA Primary School for three years, 76 to 79. Then I gained admission to the School of Ghana Languages at Ejumako. So that was from 79 up to 82. At the time that I was about to finish, the director, the then director, Mr. K.B. Aydan, said that he had heard about me and that he was not going to leave me to set out of the school. He was going to employ me to teach there. So I had a first class at the diploma level, three years. Yeah, yeah, prof? Yes. Your parents were farmers? Yes. Peasant farmers? They, they never went to school. What made you so eager to want to be educated? Because all the way from P1, my teachers, I don't know what they saw in me, said that this guy, he'll be doing something in future. So when I was in P2, I went to P3 for just two weeks. And in those days, they jumped me. They, I was hopped to go and join the P4 people. So I never spent one month in. And my, my village was too small, you know, say, and if you look at that time, we were even, we were the pioneers. But would you say you were gifted, especially intelligent, or was it because you were so de desirable and eager to want to study? I, I was a very hard-working child, even from my primary school days. In primary school, I was always working. They give me homework, I'll do it. When I was in the middle school, there was... Uh, a mathematics book called s &M. yes and I could just assign myself some work and I, I normally like those reading sums that will cover about half a page and I'll try to solve and there were answers so I was always moving ahead uh, of my colleagues so what was your dream in life then what was the vision you had that so motivated you to want to do all the things that you were telling me about? I think having heard from my, my teachers then that I was a good uh, people, I felt I could feather. And that's why from elementary school, I initially sat for training college when I was in final year. Unfortunately, that was the time they were changing some of the schools from training college to uh, secondary schools. I chose to do my training college. They changed it. And that was how I became a people teacher. I got a letter from the National Training Council that you've appointed uh, a people teacher. And that's where the whole thing started. Do you remember any of the pupils that you taught them at school as a people teacher? But that would be very difficult. But that was a small village. I know there were a guy called Pipim, Pipim Kutin and Pipim, and then there were Hana Opokuya and those people. Now I, I may not be able to tell where they are, but it's now within the Mpodwa district. So from people teacher, you entered? Training college. Training college, and entered university later? No, from training college, I taught for three years because that was mandatory. You had to sign a, bo a bond with the Ghana Education Service, that after training college, you have to teach at least for three years. So I made sure that I taught for three years. And then after that, I went to do the three-year diploma, completing in 1982, from 79 to 82. And whilst there, I did the A-level, because I didn't want to go beyond the three-year. So 82, by 85, I had gained all my 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 subjects for entry into university and that's how i came to legon in 1985. so you came to legon at what age i came to legon 1985 at 31. at 31. yes and were you discouraged to see your peers who were perhaps much younger than you were but around that time we also had some teachers it was the six from time okay. so people who came in had gone through five years two years some might have not been able to qualify for the first time 
And then we had also teachers who were here on study leave, just like me. So you didn't stand alone? In not at all. Okay. Not at, and I knew why I was here. So why were you there? I was here because I wanted a degree. <laughs> <laughs> as simple as that. Degree in what subject? Degree in, because I had done Ghanaian language at a Jumakon. And when I was filling the form, I was advised by one Dr. Anokumi that having done Ghanaian language, linguistics will be one of the best options. Because I also did a little bit of linguistics at a Jumakon. Would you have done any other subjects apart from linguistics? Actually, when I was in elementary school and training college, my best subject was mathematics. And I was stopping in mathematics. So you could have been a science student. Yeah, but I realized that doing the O level and A level of, on my own, uh, it wasn't possible for me to branch into science. That's why I moved into languages. What was the difficulty? Then? The difficulty is that O level, you have to do some, some lab work. And then A level, you have to do lab. And I didn't attend any, any kind of classes here and there. So the only option was to do reading sums, which I could do on my own. After school, I'll just sit down, buy the books and read. I'll go to Wyke office in Kumasi, Unicorn House, look for the syllabus, buy past questions, and then just do so my own reading. Linguistics was by your own choice? Uh, here. Yeah. Yes, because linguistics was not done at O level, neither at A level, but Ghanaian language was done. So I did tree at O level and I did Akan at A level. Why did you choose tree and Akan? And I, not any other language. Okay, that's the only language. Looking at where I grew up, that was the only language I could offer. You could have uh, done French or Spanish? No, because I didn't go to secondary school and at that time we were not doing uh, French at training college during our time. What has been the benefit of you doing tree and I have never regretted, and, I, and let me tell you, at the time that I was coming to Legon, entering Legon, I had also applied to go to UCC. And UCC, uh, I did choose Akan, Sociology, and other course, I think education. And then here I took Russian, political science and linguistics. Russian for the mere fact that I had been told that if you're a student of Russian, you had the opportunity to spend one year abroad. And I, and I felt that was an opportunity for a village boy <laughs> <laughs> to be able to travel outside. So when I came here, I spent one month. Legon opened earlier. And then the admissions for Cape Coast came. In those days, they will publish it in the newspapers. And I remember very well, I had spent one month here with linguistics, political science, and Russia. And they gave me education, sociology, and one other course. But I had been here for one month, so I just decided to stay. But since, since then, you have published over 39. But that, that was the mean, I don't know where your information is coming from. It should be a bit. Currently, I have 61 articles. 61 published articles. And you are still writing. And I'm still writing. At any point in time, I have some papers under review. And I have about 15 books. These are some of them. And I'm still publishing. What are the things that you write about? I have been a crusader of the Akan language. That's one. Anywhere I go, I want people to feel that it's like any other language, except that probably because of where we are coming from, we've not been able to document it to the maximum level that, that we want. So my areas are language and culture. I do everything about anthropological linguistics. I've specialized in areas of terminology. And what I did for terminology, I did that for my PhD. Said that you can use Akan to teach everything Akan. You can use Akan to teach literature. Use Akan to teach the phonetics and phonology of Akan. Use Akan to teach semantics, everything. So the product of that thesis, my PhD, is this small book called Akan Terminology. 
uh, English Akan Linguistics and the Media Studies. That's one. I've also done a lot of work on Akan Verbal Taboos. What people, there are two different kinds of taboos. Some are behavioral, don't do this, don't do this. But my, my interest as a linguist is, instead of don't do this, I want to say don't say this. And that was what I did for my MPhil thesis. And the outcome of that is this book, Akan Verbal Taboos. And it involves the use of our oaths, the traditional oaths we call in term, and other issues. And then I sat down also to find out what can the accounts who write and read in Akan gain from me. So then I did this book called Akan Kasan Sheshe, which is a grammar book. So students at the SHS level, people who go to Winneba, and even here and UCC, they use this as one of the books to help them in grammar. And then I did this Akan Kasajuni. This is out of terminology. So Kasajuni is made up of two components. Kasa, which is language, and Ejuni is art. So Kasajuni then means verbal art, which is literature. So this is about oral literature of the Akan people. And the topics include folk tales, proverbs, riddles, folk songs, and everything that people need to know about are that. Are books popular? No, as far as I'm concerned, they are very popular, especially these two, these three. Winnie by UUW, Department of Ghanaian Languages, UCC, Department of Ghanaian Languages, and most of the work they do their longest essays on literature, these are extensively quoted. Some years back, there was the, the view that Ghana should have a language that is Ghanaian and not English. Okay. Would you still promote that agenda? Yes and no. Your okay. Yes, in the sense that every country to move forward, you may need a national language. And a national language is different from official language. In Ghana, the official language is English. Okay, so if you look at the number of people who speak English as compared to the non-speakers of English, you're going to find out that there are a lot of people around who cannot manage English, whether in the written form or in the oral form. So if we had a language that is indigenous to us, that would be the national language. It helps in the promotion of expressions, people are free to. A, a very good example of what that could have been is what we're experiencing these days in the media front, where people broadcast in the local languages. So people who want to contribute will just pick their phone and they don't think of grammar. Is it yesterday I did go or I did went? <laughs> Far from that, they'll speak in their natural way and express themselves, themselves very well. That's also helping governance. Because instead of cutting a lot of people out of democracy, governance, and participation. Now, almost everybody can listen to a radio station in the local language. So that would have been the advantages. You can also see that it is manifesting when we look at a religion. Open your radio, open your TV, and you see a lot of sermons are preached in the indigenous Ghanaian languages. So that would have been their sense. Go to Mokola Market, go to all the, the markets in our cities. What do people communicate when they are trading? It's the local language, almost everywhere. So in Ghana, what language, what of the local languages would one push to be accepted as a national language? I'll come there. So that is where the no begins. Okay. Because language is very sentimental. In the attempt to impose one of the languages, on the people could bring some kind of chaos, political chaos. So what I have said several times and I can say here is that I have what I call the plateau approach, which means that water finds its own level. As we sit here, if we put some water here, nobody will direct the water as to 
what the channel will be. So I think personally, let's allow each member of this good nation of ours to decide which Ghanaian language he wants to study or add it to his own native language. And eventually, one of them will come out or pop out as a language that everybody wants to learn. So you don't force anybody. Let a person seize the needs for learning language A instead of language B. Why, why do you think that attempt to single out one language or find a national language failed? Mm. Because one, geographically, if you look at the demography, the linguistic demography of Ghana, you're going to find out that out of the 10 regions, Akan is spoken in about six of them. It's spoken in almost everywhere in central region, mostly. Speaking in most parts of western region, eastern region, Ashanti region actually is one, one region with one people as natives, part of Branhaf. And then the part of that I call the sandwich accounts in northern Volta. So six, okay. If you look at non-native speakers who want to use this language, they will also outnumber any other language. That's true. Now, if we start now, and we say, okay, come next year, let's make Akan the, the national language. I can tell you, some people will genuinely stand up against that. There will be some people who will also stand up because of mischief. So we don't decree on such things. That's why I want to go in for the, the plateau approach. The water level. The water level. So you decide that, okay, I'm an Akan. Which language do I want to add? Do I go in forever? You should have your own motivational reasons. If you are a, a, a Dagbani and you've come to Kumasi and you are an artisan, a mechanic, nobody should tell you to learn a little bit of tree so that you can operate very well in your, in, in your work. So let's leave people, instead of imposing things on people, for them to revolt. Prof, yes. from the beginning, I wanted you to explain the two titles that you have, Teacher Ketwa. Okay. How did you get that one? And now it's been changed to Opein. Okay. What is the story behind these two names? A teacher Ketwa is something I gained as a people teacher. I started as a people teacher at age 15, and I was too short. And sometimes I had to stand on a, a small table to write, very smallish. And any time I was working, they said, oh, this is a teacher Ketua. And I remember when I went to a conference for the first time, uh, the master, the head teacher, sent me to the committee chairman's home. And he said, oh, master, transfer, master, please sit down. Oh, can we offer a seat to your nephew? And then he said, no, he's not my nephew. He's the new teacher you people have got. And everybody in the house broke into laughter. Said, oh, what a teacher. The following morning I was in my classroom when I saw people standing by the windows trying to find out who this teacher is. Right. Teacher Ketue. And I remember one woman said, oh, as for some women, they don't have some compassionate for their old children. Why do you leave such a small boy to travel alone to this place to come and teach? <laughs> but that was the beginning of being a teacher, and I've remained in that. What about your pain? When, when I came here, after 1996, when I came back from my uh, graduate studies from Norway, I studied in Norway for my MPhil. When I came, I started a show at Radio Universe, and it's still there called Ephesim. But I started the translation of the new editorials of the newspapers from English to Tree. There was none like that in 1997. That time, Professor Yanka, the current Deputy Minister for Tertiary Education, Minister in State of Tertiary, he was the chair of the board of uh, Radio Universe. And he knew me because he was my lecturer when I was a student. 
So we introduced the review of the newspapers from English into Chi. So what I was doing, every week I look at the editorials of the newspapers, translate them into Chi for broadcasting. That was before Peace FM. And, and that has become a novelty. Yes, and almost everywhere. Every station is doing, doing that. And when I sit back and watch and listen, I get a little bit furious and bored that the, everybody seems to be adopting the same system, the same format, the same production line. What do you have to say about that? What is worrying me as the, the peace setter is that I was more concerned about the editorials of the newspapers because that speaks the voice of the newspaper. I wasn't interested in the sensational front page titles here and there because I knew what I was doing as a linguist. Of late, what I've seen is that people going for the sensational partisan headlines and that brings that will bring the people together from this party and that party i see them heckling themselves at the radio station if we can concentrate more on the social stories rather than just using about 80 percent of the time discussing things that will bring people bring their heads together and they, they start fighting doing verbal duel for me you've hit the nail on the head verbal duel I think that the media in general, both electronic and print, don't seem to pr be promoting our democracy in the right direction. They seem to be promoting a duopoly of the two major political parties and there's no alternative view from the two of them. You switch on the radio or television and you see two people sitting down having a discussion and you can tell from the angles and who they are that they're going to choose a particular line. And I think it's, it's a bit upset, upsetting. I don't know what you think about I, it. I go to Radio Universe and uh, I go to Peace FM. It's Peace FM that gave me the title opening. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. And what I do is that I'll go there and meet all kinds of newspapers. Some are actually trash as far as I'm concerned. And the people who meet me there will know which newspapers I'll pick. So sometimes I get there and say, opening, these are your papers. But well, there are some papers I will look at the headline, I'm not ready to read. Because they have already taken some stance and it's difficult. I think going forward, we should be able to distinguish between what are developmental and social stories from those that are purely partisan and bring some kind of animosity between people who sit there. Unfortunately, the listeners don't know, but I've, I've met them, and I know they talk very nicely at each other. They finish and they chat. They can move together and go and eat. Meanwhile, their voice and what people hear is war. War. But how are you able to cut yourself away from the partisan nature of the discussions? Obviously, you are Ghanaian. Yes. Obviously, you cast your vote. Yes. Obviously, you have some inclination towards one party or the other. Mm -hmm. How are you able to cut yourself away from that? No, I believe that I go there as, as a professional, a linguist. And part of my linguistic studies are in the areas of language and politeness. I do pragmatics, so I know context of usage, when to speak, when not to speak, how to speak, how to structure your speech. I know that. And I have also worked on verbal taboos, as I mentioned. So I know words that can bring some affront to people. I know words that can touch on the emotions of people. I know words that are invective in, in orientation so that if you say A instead of B, people will start fighting. So I know that. And I use a lot of figurative expressions. One of my cardinal things is proverbs. Because these are alluded to the sages and alluded to the witticism and wisdom of our ancestors who had the experience so sometimes they'll cut things short for me 
instead of elaborating and elaborating, sometimes I'll use one or two proverbs and I'll tell Kwame, maybe Manuesi. That's about that. And as the Bible says, for those who have their ears, let them listen to the gospel, to the words of God. Another interesting aspect of your appearance on radio is that you tend to educate that particularly the account speaking people of the kind of words they should use as you've just said and not to use um, have you ever faced a, a, a situation where people misunderstood what you were saying not to the best of my knowledge what I really experienced is that I'll say something and somebody sends a text message to the host and say can you as opening to explain this further for us so that's where the education I, i'm doing a current paper on the decadence of the language via the media but i've come to realize that even though the media is helping to strengthen and more or less propagate their sense of the language there are certain expressions that they use on the lang on the media that shouldn't have been so anytime i get the opportunity I walk them through some of the tidbits uh, so that people become educated. It is appearing to be the fact that anybody who sits before the mic as a broadcaster, not like your type, thinks that he has, he or she has all the knowledge and the expertise to say whatever he or she thinks. That also brings me to something that I'd like you to advise on it, that the issue of news readers making an interpretation of their own which does not reflect the news item that they are broadcasting and also in certain proverbs and certain adjectives to the news program and making it comical you will you experience the knowledge what's your advice to, on this i issue? think news should be news and news are normally factual events or things that really happened and it's the duty of the broadcaster just to record and tell us what exactly happened there are some people who will bring their own opinions into the news as if they are interpreting that is wrong i'm not a journalist but i'm a linguist i don't know the type of training journalists have i also know that if you are telling me something be straightforward concise precision is very important so that you start and i know that the sen this sentence has ended in another sentence but if you start with a sentence and you start with the subject of the sentence and before you go to the verb you've brought in about four proverbs and meanwhile i don't know where the subordinate clause is ending for the main clause to be added then you've confused me the more would you, would you ascribe this to lack of training, professional training? I've said several times that people need in-service training as broadcasters. What I've realized is that when people start and they get hailed by the audience, oh, he's very good, they get swollen headed. And instead of advancing further, training themselves by studying other things, I don't think they do. What about the use of English language in the various Akan languages when they are doing the presentation? That's code switching. And code switching is bad because in terminology, this one I did, you see that this part, media grocery. So there are certain expressions that you can find ready-made expressions for them. For instance, the word for the ministry is asuyeye. And the concept sphere means to download. So you're carrying this and it's heavy. And then you want to send it to the place where you can download it. So if you take the Ministry of Education, you, you tag is there, the University Teachers Association. Protag is there, Kewu is there, Grassak is there, Chas is there. They are all carrying loads like this. So the place for them to come and download whatever they have is the ministry. So that is say, that's why it is Asuye. And the minister is referred to, in terms of terminology, as Oswafo, 
the carrier. So they all bring these kinds of loads there, and it's the duty of the minister. So these are terms that will be there as tools for the broadcaster to be using. If the broadcaster does his or her homework very well, before she or he sits by the mark, you should know what terms to be used. Because there are certain terms that we have, either the quend equivalent or the pure terms to be used instead of code switching or code missing. Another issue that I'd like you to educate me on is the use of the word enemy. It seems to me, I'm not a linguist like you are, but it seems to me that we don't have the account or the vernacular for an opponent, but we always refer to them as an enemy more than an opponent or a rival. Can you give me education on that, please? Okay. Normally, when you're translating from one language to another, you have to look at the conceptual framework of the people. Because languages differ. So it's possible to have one word in language A, which may not get equivalent in language B. Language A may have different types of vocabulary for the same term. If you take the English word to wear, wear something, so wear uniform, wear glasses, anything that is supposed to be put onto the body, they will use wear, and they use even he wears a beard, he wears a nice hairstyle, he wears shoe, he wears belt, he wears watch. In the Akan language that I know, depending on the process, by which the type of clothing gets to the body, you may need a different verb. So if it is something that should start from a point and go around and come back, we use to coil, we use bo, so a bo belt, a bo watch, a bo duku. But the English we use where? For everything. For everything. And if there's something that has got an aperture or a, a, an enclosure where you have to fix the body into it, that is she. So, t-shirt and t-shirt is the best. So you have the opening and you, you push your hair there, and then wash babwa. But if you have to wrap the thing round, you won't say wash toma, ufran toma. So these are that. If you take the word to peel in English, p e e l, it all means that you take the outer part of something from it. So the peel banana. The pea oranges, the pea cassava, the pea potato, almost everything is peeled, including banana and corn. In this language that we speak, depending on the process by which you get the outer from it, you may need a different verb. So if it is this approach, it's sensing. So we sensing by this way. You don't peel by here. No, you say you say peel in English, but the process involved in this language, you say sensitive. So you're sensitive, okay. yes, yes, sensitive bayere, yes, sensitive potato. But for orange, if you are going to use your hand, you are going to say jo. But the English person will still say peel. peel. For peanut, what do you call peanut? We we were taught to call it groundnut. You have to press it this way. Is bo. So you can say, you can in katia, that's a different one, but born katia from the nut. But if it is a top-down approach, so you have banana, is this way, that way, you will say, you have to say, I will use the same thing also for, for maize or corn. If it is this approach, from this angle towards where your stomach is, and then you press it this way and that way, it's jab. So you jab out here. Prof, I, li I like to suggest something to you. We used to have on GBC radio, English by radio. And that, that was uh, everyday English. Everyday English. It was done by my, my professor, Professor Ele Bwedi. Yeah, we don't have that anymore. No. But can we have a can by radio? It depends on who will get time to do it. You are there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already overstretched. <laughs> well, on this program, we also try to get people who happen to know you, people, your colleagues or friends, to uh, join us in the conversation. Okay. 
and make some remarks about you. Okay. And uh, we are trying to contact Dr. Joshua Amwa. He's the head of music department, School of Performing Arts, University of Ghana, Legon. Okay. Let's see what he has to say about you. Okay. Okay. Yes, um, I'm Dr. Joshua Alfred Amwa, lecturer, a senior lecturer in the music department, the head of the department as well. The uh, music department is one of the departments in the School of Performing Arts. Okay. Professor Kofi Ejekum is the acting dean. In fact, I've met Professor Ejekum since the last 20 years. And very intimately, the last five years, when he became the acting dean of the School of Performing Arts, where I've also served as the the head of the department of music department. And uh, with this, our relationship as a head and team, I mean, very cordial. Besides that, we have personal relationship as a friend, and I love working with him. Well, I've liked Opeyin Ejekum, one, and I always call him OP, or Opeyin Ejekum, so much, because he's a Methodist. Initially, the first time we met him 20 years ago, he wanted an organist, so he saw me to go and accompany his church. Unfortunately, my hands were full, so I couldn't go to do that. And then, when he became the dean, where I also served in the School of Women Arts, where I also served as the head, we've collaborated enough writing papers together. I bet you we are very intimate. We share common problems. He doesn't care about his age and my age. We relate as father and son, and we relate as friends. When I have any problem, I go and share with him. We write papers and publish papers together. He takes me around to see where he's publishing his books. Maybe because of something good he has seen in me by way of publication. And I've liked him so much. I know his family and he knows mine. I visit him in the house and he officially pays me a visit in my house as well. You are listening to Easy FM 107.5, the program Conversation with me, Mike Egan. And my guest tonight is... Professor Opein Kofi Ejekum. Prof, yes, sir. I'd like us to talk about an issue that you raised not too long ago about tribal groupings at the, on campus, where we have the Musa, Kusasis, the Fantis, the Western, the Eastern. And the, what is your reservation about that? I'm sure there's something I said some, some couple of years back. I don't know whether that's where you picked it. On campus here, there are a lot of ethnic affiliations and associations. I know when we were students, we used to have that. And those days, we were using that also to network ourselves. And especially when we were on holidays, we wanted to hire a bus. And those of us going to Kumasi, it sends us to Kumasi, those of us of our friends who were going to Brown, we send them. That was fine. I had attended one meeting. I was invited by ASU, Ashanti Students Union. Then, before the end of that, somebody got up and said, Oh, after this meeting, all Amancia students should wait. And another person said, All sexual students should wait. I said, What is this? I mean, within ASU, there are now privileges. You have some portions. So I felt if they don't take care about that, it is going to bring about some kind of conflicts. So I felt as Ghanaians, less unite. That's why we went to boarding school, we go to church, we do things together rather than trying to divide ourselves into smaller units based on ethnicity. That was my pick. So you, you think that is, is not a healthy exercise? It, it may depend on how you manage it. Anything into the streams, knowing that we are this and therefore we should do this, is bad. Because if you have a lecturer, the lecturer is teaching almost every student, no matter where the student comes from, whether it's from Saboba or Tumu or Yendi or Axim or Hohoi or Aflau, they are all your students. So if you don't take care and then we get a lecturer who has been so much immersed into this thing, what happens? Hmm. What happens? <laughs> and another national issue which is very, very current today is corruption. What can we do to 
curtail corruption or reduce the intensity of corruption in our society today? And there are two things that we can do. One, let's intensify the issue of civic education and uh, more or less make sure that patriotism works. When we were growing up, we had patriotic songs. Be around soon. These songs were things that were recording things in our minds. The books that we were reading, they were written by Guineans. So we had the Kamehe. That's why sometimes I'm very much concerned about the use of our Guinean languages. Because the books we read, Kamehe, a film school, Nimdia Kwanchre, you see some chapters there addressing the peoples as to the things they should do and the things they shouldn't be doing. So if we try to build this civic responsibility in the children, for them to love their country more than themselves, more than their parties, more than their families, more than their schools and more than their churches, that will be a step forward. But beyond that, let us try to make the laws of this country work. Because I can't imagine somebody taking our money, millions of cities, then we send a person to public accounts committee, and then they interview the people around, the person may decide to weep or bow down in shame, and that is the end. And every year, we sit down at public accounts committee. So it becomes rewarding to steal our money. After all, nothing happens to you. So you don't, you don't think that the setting up of the special prosecutors uh, ministry is going to help? That, that should be able to help. That should be able to help. Uh, the, the other thing about that is that before everybody is sent there, the Attorney General's office should have done their homework very well so that anybody sent there will be found guilty and then we get our money. If appears to be the fact that everybody saying they will be left off the hook, and then the power there will be shrinking. That, that's my opinion. Hmm. We, we have to think about that. That we are sending this person there. What is the evidence? How much evidence have we gathered? Because that person will definitely go with a lawyer. And let's make sure that our lawyers are the attorney general's a department are also well paid and they are committed to the job so that they will do the job wholeheartedly. That aspect of somebody was sent, there was not much uh, evidence from the prosecution. Uh, no, I don't buy that idea. Looking at Ghana from independence 1957 to today, do you think we have made reasonable progress in developmental programs? Oh, yes. Yes. Because if you look at our road system, road network, there were places for years they haven't seen anything which was dark as far as their roads were concerned. Now they have asphalt or kotal, as we call it. Education had not moved to every single village. Uh, when I was growing up, I knew of some of my eldest brothers who had to move from our village to go and stay at some other villages just to have middle school living certificate. Now almost every, electricity is, is almost everywhere. Check Accra, for instance, the past 20 years. But when I was a student, 85, all the way from National Theater to the airport runabout here. Most of the buildings that you are seeing there, they were in there. Look at our airport. It wasn't like that. Legon, where we are now, a lot of buildings have sprung up. At the time that we were here, most of them were not here. Because the population is also increasing, and we have to find a way. So to catch in, are you trying to tell me that you are satisfied with the progress we've made so far? No, if you become so complacent, you'll move. There's always the need to say that I need to forge ahead and add certain things. 
a lot of things are also going on very bad. That, for instance, if you take our education system, we've not been able to manage the infrastructure in our institutions vis-a-vis -vis the increase in population in terms of students. So we still have to move forward and do other things. Look at other countries, how they are faring. And we can only do that if we're able to minimize the corruption so that monies that come into the state are used for the items that they have been requested for or slated for. A question that I usually put my guests because of their position and their dispensation, their experience and wisdom, is that if you had an invitation from the president, and I'm not restricting that to only Nana Kufu Ado, but if a president invited you to his office and said, help me to develop a certain program that will advance the country, what advice would you give to that leader? It may depend on the sector that he has in mind. As I sit here, there are certain things that I can do. Not certain, many things that I don't have the expertise. So if she should invite me, I'll first find out from him, Mr. President, what do you want me to do? If it is within my expertise, I'll be ready to contribute to my quota. Your expertise in this case will be education. <laughs> so yeah. if the president asked you, what's your advice on education? Right now we're having some difficulty with the mm. SHS. Yes. What, what advice would you give the president to be able to advance this? satisfactorily and successfully? Uh, that, that was a very crucial question, but let me try to make an attempt. I've spoken about this several times. I have no qualms about the introduction of the free SHS. And I've said, if during my time that I was struggling to be a people teacher and going to training college and those things. Working it, and paying your school paying fees. Paying my school fees. If there had been free SHS, I'm sure I would have been a professor earlier than when I became a professor. <laughs> so it's a very good idea. What is lacking is whether we really plan very well and envisage all these teething problems that we are facing now. I, I, I don't know. I'm not part of the planning system and I'm not privy to all the things that went into that. So probably uh, this one I was talking about engagement with the stakeholders, whether all the stakeholders, including the universities, are aware of what will happen when all these children have finished with the SHS and they are coming to university. So those are the things that we have to sit down and plan ahead. Yes. Because now SHS graduates, we are now having the second year. So come this year, we are going to have the third year. And the third year people will be coming vis-a-vis -vis the universities and our infrastructure. Are we ready for all of them? Because whether we like it or not, the numbers will be increased. So those are some of the things we have to sit down and think about. Now, advice for the younger generation. I think for the younger generation, life depends on how you want to make it. No matter the type of parents you have, <coughs> But I have the best parents, the richest parents in town, the millionaires in town. If you, the youth, as a member of the youth, if you don't plan well ahead, you may fail. So as I told you, I started planning that I, I want to learn and move forward. And Mr. Mike, let me tell you, when I came back from Norway, I came with a master's. In my department of linguistics, any time there was a memo, they were listing the professor's name first, followed by the doctors, and those of us who were Mr. and, and Madame or Mrs. Our names were always down at the, at the bottom. And when I went to the classroom and I was teaching because I'm coming from a teacher training background, the students admired my teaching. But meanwhile, I didn't have the qualifications to move to the top. So I told myself that I won't remain at the bottom here. So about six years down the lane, I had promoted myself to the level of senior lecturer. 
the being that says yes, I had finished my PhD. Then three years after that, so I had my PhD in 2003, senior lecturer 2002. 2005, I was associate professor. Then I said, no, that is not enough for me. <laughs> I think I can still move forward. Then I moved forward in 2010, I was a full professor. And since after that, as I told you, I keep on writing. What you see there was uh, an award, Kwame Nkrumah Genius Award, given to me just 2017. I've been awarded the best teacher for the humanities in 2007. I had the other voter award by the president in 2007 too. And I still know that I can move forward. I miss other smaller uh, awards from churches, from NGOs, all those things. But I still know that I have the expertise to move forward. So if you're a young man and you are just starting, make sure that if you want to work very hard, you must be committed to the job. You should have interest in whatever you are doing. You must be sincere. And all in all, you must be God-fearing. Hallelujah. That, that's what my Methodist doctrine tells me. Before we leave, uh, before I release you, okay. how many languages do you speak? I can say I speak Akan. I speak English, a little bit of English. <laughs> now I speak a little bit of Norwegian. And uh, just a little bit of Russian because it has been a long time I've not been practicing. So, but, you, so you're a multilingual person? Somehow, but not as perfect as other people's are. I must say you are a very modest man. <laughs> Professor, many thanks for the time. Thank many you. thanks for the experience. Thank you very many much. Many thanks for the conversation. Thank you. And God bless you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good.